Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church for worship on the Sunday. Today is the second Sunday of Easter. God's word encourages us again with the great fact of our faith, our Savior lives. That fills us with peace, joy, and hope. Today is also in the life of our congregation Confirmation Sunday. Six Trinity youth will speak their vows of lifelong faithfulness to Christ. All of us reflect on God's word and the promises we have made to stay true to our Savior. We will follow the order of service as printed out in your service folder. We sing together the opening hymn number 142. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we stand before the Lord in worship. We have no right to worship because we are sinful. So let us humble ourselves before the Lord, seeking his grace and mercy to pardon us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am a sinner by birth. I agree with your judgment that all kinds of sin come out of my sinful heart. I admit my guilt before you. I deserve your condemnation for eternity. Show me your mercy and grace in Christ, who died for me and was raised again. Pardon all my sins because of Christ. God, our Heavenly Father, in Christ Jesus, shows us his mercy. He does not treat us as we deserve because of our sins. Christ died for us to redeem us from sin, death, and the devil's power. Take heart in the good news from God's word. Your sins are forgiven because of Christ, who died for you 
and was raised again. Let us pray. O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The first lesson from God's Word is found in the book of Colossians, chapter 2. We are reminded here of the great things that God has done for us in Christ. Because Jesus has saved us and risen from the dead, we want to follow. And we've been connected to Christ, to his death and resurrection, through baptism. Therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him by being rooted and built up in him, and strengthen in the faith just as you were taught while you overflow in faith with thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, which are in accord with human tradition, namely the basic principles of the world, but not in accord with Christ. For all the fullness of God's being dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been brought to fullness in him. Christ is the head, over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done by human hands in the putting off of the flesh, in the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with Christ in baptism. And in baptism you were also raised with him through the faith worked by the God who raised Christ from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Together we sing the psalm of the day, it's Psalm 16, It has an Old Testament prophecy about Jesus' resurrection from the dead.
Let's all stand for the reading of the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for today from the Gospel of John records for us two of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances to his disciples, underscoring the fact that he truly is alive. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Together, let's confess the facts of the Christian faith as they are summarized in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Next we go to the children's message. Children, you're invited to come up front if you'd like to come up for the children's message. Don't be shy. All right, I'll just do it from here. Um, Difficult thing is it's hard to see sometimes, pictures. But I have here a picture of a purple unicorn. It's black and white. You can't tell it's purple, but I knew it was from the Internet. A purple unicorn. You can see it's a horse with wings and a big horn on its head. And what if I told you I have this purple unicorn in my backyard and I ride it all the time? You'd say to me, what? Pastor Yonke, you don't have a purple unicorn. Those are just pretend. And I would tell you, no, no, I I really do. And you'd say to me, "Mm, unless I touch it, unless I get to pet the horse and ride on it and soar through the eye, air, I won't believe you. Unless I see it, I'm not going to believe it. That's what you'd say to me if I told you something that sounded impossible. Let's talk about something that isn't pretend for a minute. Think about what happened to Jesus. We celebrated it last week on Friday. Jesus was betrayed by his friends and he was hurt by people that were religious leaders. They put nails in his hands. They put nails in his feet. They put him on a cross. And when he died, they poked him in the side with a spear and cut him. And then they took his body down and they buried it in a tomb. That really happened. That's not pretend. And then what happened three days later? Easter morning came, 
And all of a sudden, the tomb where Jesus was buried was empty. Because Jesus, who died, rose again from the dead. Jesus, who was dead, is now alive. Who's ever heard of that before? And so Jesus appeared to his friends, the disciples. And he showed them that he was alive. But one of the friends, named Thomas, was not there. So the other friends told Thomas, Thomas, Jesus is alive. And Thomas said, mm, I don't know, guys. That doesn't happen. Unless I see it, unless I touch where the nails were, unless I touch where the spear pier pierced his side, I'm not going to believe it. Very similar to how you would react if I told you I had a purple unicorn. I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. Well, guess what happened? A week later, Thomas is there with his friends when all of a sudden, Jesus appears. And Jesus showed Thomas his hands, and he showed him his side. He said, go ahead, touch me, Thomas, and you'll see. It's me. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas saw Jesus, and he said, my Lord and my God. Thomas believed Jesus was really alive and that he was his Savior. Jesus helped Thomas to believe. Jesus helps you and me to believe as well. He doesn't show up in our houses and show us his hands and his side, but Jesus helps us to believe by giving us the Bible and his Holy Spirit. When we read in the Bible that Jesus died and rose again, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and the Holy Spirit leads us to believe that Jesus really is alive and we believe it even if we don't see it. And we say, Jesus is my Lord and my God, just like Thomas did. So Jesus helps us to believe just like he helped Thomas. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know and believe that you died for our sins and rose again and that you now live eternally. Just as you helped Thomas to believe, you help us to believe. Keep us always trusting in you, our Lord and our God. Amen. We continue with the next hymn.
For our sermon this morning, we turn our attention to the words of John, the Apostle John, and his revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 18. I'll read those now. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is coming, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood and made us a kingdom and priest to God his Father, to him be the glory and power forever. Amen. Look, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him, and all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and the one who was and the one who is coming, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingship that, and, and patient endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. I was in spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write what you see on a scroll and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like a son of man. He was clothed with a robe that reached to his feet, and around his chest he wore a gold sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool or snow, or like snow. His eyes were like blazing flames. His feet were like polished bronze being refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters, and he held seven stars in his right hand. A sharp two-edged sword was coming out of his mouth. His face, face was shining as the sun shines in all its brightness. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. I also hold the keys of death and hell. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, the people to whom John wrote this letter, wrote this book, were people who were suffering intensely because of their faith. They're being persecuted, just as John himself was being persecuted because of his testimony about Jesus. Their very lives were at stake because these people believed that Jesus was the Son of God who died, was buried, but then rose again. And because the believers were suffering so intensely, they began to ask questions. They questioned whether or not it was worth it. Was the suffering really worth it? And so God, through the Apostle John, wanted to encourage believers in Jesus. And so in our text for today, God the Father, through John, wants to encourage you and me, believers in Jesus in this life. As John begins this letter of encouragement, he greets people in the name of the triune God. Now today we have confirmation students with us. And these six students, if we asked, I won't, but if we asked, they could all tell you what the word triune means. Triune means that we have one God and that one God exists in three persons who are all equally God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet, there are not three gods, there is just one. It's an article of faith, right? We can't really understand it, but we believe it because that's what the Scripture teaches. And yet, if we look at John and we look at how he describes the Trinity, John describes each person of the Trinity in a unique way as to encourage and inspire those people who need to renew their hope in their glorious God. So when John greets people in the name of God the Father, he describes God the Father as the one who is, who was, and who is coming. God the Father is the one who is past, who is present, who is f future. God the Father is eternal. He's timeless. John wants to encourage with that, us with that. The one, the Father, is eternal. 
And then John greets people in the name of the Holy Spirit. Only if you look at the text, John doesn't say the Holy Spirit. He says, the seven spirits before his throne. Well, that's kind of an odd way to describe the Holy Spirit. Why does he call him that? Well, we have a couple options here. The first option could be because of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where Isaiah describes the Holy Spirit with seven distinct adjectives. That's one option. The other option has to do with the way that God consistently throughout the book of Revelation uses the number seven in a very special way. And if that's the case, what God is drawing our attention to here is that the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to faith in Jesus and into a covenant relationship with God. To say more about it at this point really goes against the purpose of our sermon, so we'll pause there on that. But then John greets people in the name of the Son, in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you look, John describes Jesus in three very distinct and different ways. He calls Jesus, first of all, a faithful witness. Then he calls Jesus the firstborn from among the dead. And then he calls him the ruler of the kings of the earth. Let's talk about each, each one of those, shall we? An eyewitness, or a witness, is someone who tells you what they saw, what they experienced. Jesus is the only one ever to be face to face with God the Father. Jesus is the only one ever to come from heaven. So Jesus made the Father known. He revealed the Father by simply being an eyewitness, telling us what he experienced. And in doing so, he was proclaiming God's word to us. And what Jesus taught really took most of the established knowledge of the day and flipped it on its head, at least as far as it went to what people believed about God. And he did that by just being an eyewitness. John also says that Jesus was the firstborn from among the dead. Now what that reminds us of is that Jesus suffered and died for the sins of the world that he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead. And then Jesus promises not only does he have life, but he will give eternal life to all who believe in him. He will raise believers. So that reminds us that the truth that when Jesus comes again, or excuse me, Jesus lives and he will raise believers. He was the first one to be raised so that there will be many, many more who will follow him, the firstborn from among the dead. And then Jesus is described as the ruler of the kings of the earth. And that reminds us that Jesus rose in glory and that he ascended into heaven and now from heaven he rules over all things for the good of the church. To describe Jesus in these three distinct and different ways is really nothing other than to talk about the office of the Christ. It is to call Jesus our prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is our prophet, meaning he is the one who proclaimed God's word to us. How? By being a faithful witness. He is our priest. How? By offering the sacrifice for sin and then rising again from the dead as being the firstborn from among the dead. And he is our king. How? By ruling over all things, even over the kings of the earth. John described Jesus this way, really to show the glory that belongs to Jesus. So when John talked about the glory of our triune God, when he talked about how wonderful Jesus is and described him in these distinct ways, he was doing so to encourage those believers who were being persecuted for their faith. But that's not where God stops. God, through the apostle John, adds to that encouragement. Like the late night infomercials, wait, there's still more encouragement to be had. And the other encouragement that God adds is this, Jesus will come again. Through the Apostle John, God said, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him, and all nations on the earth will mourn because of him. Yes, amen. Believers in John's day were being physically put to death. They were being persecuted for their faith. They were being mocked and ridiculed. And that's because the people in this world, this unbelieving world, did not believe that Jesus is the glorious Son of God who rose again from the dead. 
But God comforted and encouraged believers by saying, Jesus will come again. The truth will be known. Because when Jesus comes again, he will come with the clouds of heaven and come down from heaven in such a way that no one will be able to deny it. Everybody will see it. And when Jesus returns, all those people who have been persecuting you, they will have their chance to mourn. Because when Jesus returns, their hope of salvation will be gone. Because salvation from God's wrath comes only through Christ. Salvation is found only in Jesus. And so when Jesus comes back, it'll be too late for his enemies to suddenly change their mind. And again, God tells them these things through the Apostle John to say this to the believers. Stand firm in your faith because Jesus will come again. Today, we have six young people who will be where many of us have been before. They will be up in front of church here today and they will be speaking vows of faithfulness to their triune God. And that is a difficult promise to keep. You will be promising in just a few minutes that you will remain faithful to Jesus as long as you live. That's a big promise. That will be difficult for you to keep just as it has been difficult for every one of us to keep, just as it has been difficult for every believer who's ever made that promise ever on the face of the earth to keep. Because our own sinful flesh and this sinful world make it difficult to keep that promise. There is constant pressure Even if there's not outward persecution, there is constant pressure to just not worry about living for Jesus, to just leave Jesus behind and to go on life without him. The sinful flesh will say, don't worry about living a godly life. Don't worry about living according to the Ten Commandments. Just do what you think is right. Don't worry about a sanctified Christian life. As long as you keep in your mind some random facts about Jesus, it's basically the same thing as believing in him. You're just fine. That's a lie. That is a lie. And the world will also put pressure on us. The world might not ever tell us to leave Jesus behind, but the world will say, you know, they'll make it advantageous, rather. They'll make it advantageous for you to leave behind Jesus. They'll say, you know, you could have more money if you just forget about living up to Jesus. You you know, you could have more fun. You could have more opportunities to do what you want if you just leave Jesus behind and you won't have to suffer as much. And again, that's a lie. That is an illusion of sin. That's not really true. What the truth is, The truth is that nothing this world can offer you compares to the goodness that is found in Jesus, our prophet, priest, and king. That's the truth. No one else in this world takes away your sins. No one else in this world repairs the relationship between you and God the Father. No one else in this world can take away guilt and a a nagging conscience. No one else promises you eternal life, only Jesus. No one else on this planet will love you as Jesus loves you. And no one else will come back to judge this whole world, only Jesus. And so God's encouragement for you, Convermans, who will be promising your faithfulness to Jesus, and God's encouragement to you and me who have already made that promise is this. Keep being faithful to Jesus. Stand firm in your faith because Jesus will come back again. Now, that's not the only encouragement, though, that God gives to us in this portion of his word for today. By no means does God mean for us to believe that Jesus came here, died for our sins, rose again, promises to give us heaven, and then ascended into heaven and has just left us defenseless, left us to fend for ourselves. That's not the case at all. In fact, Jesus is still with us now. Or as John describes it in his vision, Jesus is still standing among the lampstands. If you take a look at the second half of our lesson for today, John is given a vision of heaven. And in this vision of heaven, John looks and he sees Jesus standing among seven lampstands, holding seven stars in his hands. Only it doesn't look like Jesus, does it? Because the person holding the stars and standing among the lampstands has white hair, his eyes are glowing, they're ablaze. 
He's wearing a golden sash around his white robe. He's got feet that look like they're made out of hot bronze. And he's got a large sword coming out of his mouth. That's normally not how we picture Jesus. In fact, I'm willing to bet that nobody has a picture of Jesus hanging on their living room wall where he looks like that. But so that we don't get distracted by the details, let me just say this. That picture is teaching us something about Jesus. And what that picture is teaching us is that Jesus is now dwelling in heavenly glory. That when Jesus first came, he was in humiliation. But when he rose, he's in exaltation, meaning he now makes full and frequent use of all of his divine power. That's what we're seeing. And as far as that sword coming out of his mouth, that teaches us that the word of God is the very word that Jesus teaches. It's the word that comes from his mouth. And it's double-edged, meaning it's law and gospel. The word of God can cut through sin. It cuts to the heart. It exposes our sin so that we repent of it. But then the, the word of God also heals. It promises that we're forgiven. It cuts away the guilt that clings to us. It is a double-edged sword. But then we come to the really the, com the comforting part of this vision. And that is that Jesus is standing in all of his glory, standing among the lampstands, holding the seven stars in his hands. The lampstands represent congregations, gatherings of believers, churches. And the seven stars are the ministers, are the people who share the gospel in those churches. And so what we see in this vision is Jesus is standing among the churches and protecting the people who share the gospel in those churches. See, Jesus has not abandoned his church. This vision shows us just how much Jesus loves believers. He has not left us. In fact, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised his disciples and said, Surely I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. And true to his promise, here we see Jesus, with all of his glory and power, standing among believers. And just like a husband who is faithful to a wife and will not leave her when she's in trouble, so Jesus is standing among his church to protect those who are sharing the gospel, to care for them. Friends, let's go back for just a minute and revisit the fact that living for Jesus in this life is extremely difficult. In fact, Jesus tells us in the scripture that in this life, we will have trouble. That's what we can expect. And when we make a promise to be faithful to Jesus and do our best to keep it, and then all of a sudden we experience trouble in life, it makes it often feel like keeping that promise is a burden that just becomes too much for us to carry and we're all alone. It begins to feel like a heavy weight that's dragging us down. We've promised to be faithful to Jesus, but, but when all of our friends seem to be ditching us because we refuse to go along with their sinful behavior, because we're living for Jesus, we might ask, where are you, Jesus? I mean, why should I continue to be faithful to Jesus when it seems like I'm all alone here? Where are you then, Jesus? Where are you, Jesus, when everyone else is cheating and lying and stealing and they keep getting ahead and I'm doing what's right, I'm being honest and faithful, and it seems like I keep falling farther and farther behind? Where are you then, Jesus? When we suffer, when we face trouble in life, we're, we often ask the question, where are you? It's hard to be faithful in those times. Yet, friends, God wants to give you encouragement today. To you who believe in Jesus, he wants to encourage you to be faithful to Jesus. And so what he shows you today is that Jesus never leaves you. Where is he? He is right here standing among us. He stands among the lampstands with all of his glory and power. Jesus is in our midst through word and sacrament. And he's in our midst to strengthen us in faith so that we can continue to be people who reflect his light in the darkness of this world. And so that we can live for him without fear. And we truly can live for Jesus without fear in this life. Yes, we'll have trouble. Yes, we may even be persecuted. But we can live for Jesus without fear. Why? Because the one who stands among us has overcome the grave. Jesus has risen from the dead. 
He has victory over the grave, and he promises to give to you and me eternal life, and he lives to deliver on that promise. So if Jesus can give you eternal life, if he gives you victory over the grave, what can the world do to us? What do we have to fear? Nothing. And that's what Jesus tells us at the end of our lesson. Jesus said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. Friends, you who have promised to be faithful to Jesus, and to you friends who soon will, may you find encouragement from God's word today. Because God wants to encourage you to remain faithful to Jesus. Why? Because he's coming again, and he now stands among us. And the one who is with us now is the one who has overcome the grave. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We continue by joining together in the hymn.
Let's stand to pray. O Holy Spirit, you are the Lord and giver of life. From your work through the gospel and word and sacrament, we have life in the living Savior. By your work in us, we confess that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. We thank and praise you for every spiritual gift that has come to us from you. We ask you to remain in us always. Keep us connected to Jesus, the living Lord, by leading us to learn, ponder, and believe his words. Let us continually draw life from him. Holy Spirit, bless us with courage as we serve and live for our risen Savior. Give us boldness, as you did to the apostles long ago, to tell others the life-giving message of Christ crucified and risen. Help us to put into practice the gifts we have from you for serving others. Let God's kingdom come to more through our faithful efforts. Holy Spirit, we present our request in the name of Jesus, our living Lord and Savior, as we also pray together in his name, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The kind for man's may please step forward. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his dear child. You now have the privilege of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You are here to make a public confession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day, in the presence of God, and of this congregation, acknowledge that in baptism, God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Son? Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired Word of God? Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God. 
Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word, to be faithful in the use of the word and sacrament, and in, and in faith and action remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as long as you live? Since it is God alone who enables us both to will and to do his good pleasure, it is right for us, dear friends in Christ, to call on him for these confirmands, that he would graciously complete the work which he has begun in them. Therefore, let us pray. Almighty God, in baptism, you made these brothers and sisters members of the body of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. You washed them by his blood, buried them with him in his death, and gave them a new life in his resurrection. Renew them by the Holy Spirit, which you have poured out on them generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Let them live out their faith as heirs of eternal life. Lead them to serve your church in holiness and righteousness all their days. Keep them in fellowship with all who wait for the return of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what we as a Christian congregation have, have here asked our Heavenly Father to confer on all of you, we now ask him to give each of you individually. Kendra Marie Betchler, may he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Ephesians 6 verse, 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Mark Hanna, Dawn Bidor, God will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Romans 8, 38 through 39. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Micah Owen Frank, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. First Peter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Aidan James Severson, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Isaiah, oh, I have to do this first. Thank you. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to idols. Britain and Zastro, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes. Emily May Zastro, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Matthew 6, verse 34. So, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. (laughs) 
Go now in the peace of Christ, your risen Lord and Savior. Throughout life, hear his words of eternal life and follow and serve him alone. Be faithful unto death and you will receive the crown of life. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you. Amen. We continue with the hymn. Please stand for the closing prayer and blessing. Let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may, you may be seated for the singing of the closing hymn.
It is truly a joyful day as we hear Christian youth make their promises of lifelong faithfulness to Christ. We are thankful for all the instruction and training they have received first and foremost through mom and dad and through Christian teachers. We praise the Lord for bringing them to this point in their lives. Please pray for them as they move forward in their Christian lives. As Pastor Yankee said in the sermon, it is difficult to live for Christ. There are enemies lined up against every Christian to upset faith and to turn us away from our Savior. So pray for them, pray for others, and may each of us seek strengthening from Christ by receiving his word regularly. As they exit, they will go into our fireside room and form a receiving line. So by all means, please go through and wish them God's blessings and congratulations on reaching this stage in their lives. We welcome the many guests and family members and friends who are here for confirmation. If you haven't already, please sign our friendship register. You'll find it in the blue binder at the end of your pew. One note for Trinity members, this week we are starting a new Bible study topic for our Thursday Bible class. That's the class that is in-person and virtual, hybrid, Thursday mornings at 10.30, and then that class repeats at 7 o'clock virtually in the evening. We're starting a study of what's called theology. It's the doctrine of God. Who exactly is the true God? What's true about him? What is the Trinity? How do we know the one true God? Those are all the very practical questions that we will address in this new Bible study starting this week. May Christ, the living Lord, bless them and bless each of you today and every day.